Hello, and welcome to Get Yourself Published, Promote Your Research, a webinar series from the Himmelfarb Library Scholarly Communications Committee at the George Washington University. In this eight-part series, we explore tools, resources, and tips that can help you get your research published and ensure that it is widely read and cited. In our videos, we cover topics ranging from how to spot a predatory publisher to using COVID and software for a systematic review. Our webinars are publicly available and licensed under a CC BY NCSA Creative Commons license. Although some resources discussed in this series are only available to faculty, staff, and students with access to Himmelfarb library resources. My name is Tom Harrod, and I'm the research support librarian at the Himmelfarb Health Sciences Library. Today's session is called Measuring Impact, Quantifying the Effects of Your Research. My email address is tph at gwu.edu. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about the material covered in this presentation. Let's get started. Here is an outline of what I'll be talking about. We'll discuss why people care about quantifying publication impact, and then we'll look at how impact is typically quantified. This will include examples of traditional citation-based metrics, as well as newer alt metrics. We'll close with some concluding thoughts. There will also be a mini quiz attached as a link from this recording. So why do people care about this topic? Well, there are a number of reasons why people seek to quantify the impact of their scholarly publications. They may do so for tenure or promotion reasons. Many departments and schools evaluate their folks not only on the quantity of their output, but on the impact it has had in their field. Another common reason is for the purposes of benchmarking, that is, comparing the quality of output between two individuals or departments, or else comparing the relative impact of journals within a given field. People also do this to evaluate the success of a grant, that is, by looking at the impact of the articles that resulted from the grant and how those have been received within their field. The impact of scholarly works is typically measured in two different ways. Traditional bibliometrics, which is based on evaluating citation patterns, and altmetrics, or alternative metrics, which evaluates impact by counting mentions on things such as news sites, social media platforms, and online citation tools. During this session, we'll take a look at both of these in depth. There are a number of pros and cons to using traditional or citation-based bibliometrics. The main benefit of this is that it offers an objective measure of success when compared to subjective expert evaluations. It makes the evaluation process more fair and transparent. However, there are several cons to traditional bibliometrics. One of the main ones is that it can be manipulated. That is, people have found sneaky ways of influencing their citation counts including excessive or gratuitous self-citation and the creation of citation networks. Additionally, the purpose of the citation isn't taken into account. Just because I cite an article doesn't mean I think it's a good article. I may be citing an article to show how my work corrects or contradicts that prior work. A third issue is that traditional bibliometrics excludes a lot of scholarly outputs from analysis. If someone writes an article in a journal which is not indexed by one of the major citation tracking databases, then it can be very difficult to get accurate, trustworthy citation data. This last issue is a significant one for many researchers when it comes to quantifying their impact. Another thing to keep in mind is that traditional metrics are often applied to individual researchers or to scholarly journals. During this session, we're going to take a look at both of these. A common example of how they are applied to individuals that you may have come across in the past is the H-index. A person's H-index is defined as being X when they have X number of articles with X or more citations. Let's go to Scopus to see an example. I'm going to start from the Himmelfarb homepage, which is himmelfarb.gwu.edu. From here, I'm going to click on Scopus and then I'm going to click here to perform an author search. So in this case, I'm going to use myself. 
On this page I scroll down and I see that this one, the fourth record, is me. So I'm going to click on my name here. And here you can see they indicate my H index is 5. So if I scroll down to see my publications and then I sort from highest to lowest cited, I can see how they arrived at that number. So an H index of 5 means that I have 5 publications that have been cited 5 or more times. So if we go down the list, we'll see how they got that. So we see that my fifth highest public, highly, fifth most highly cited publication was cited 7 times. Number 6 was cited 0, which means that I have 5 publications that have been cited 5 or more times, which is how they arrive at the H index. Next we'll look at a journal level example, specifically the journal impact factor. To find impact factors, I'll need to go to the Journal Citation Reports database. Again, I'm going to start on the Himmelfarb homepage. This time I will click on All Databases, and then go to the letter J. I click on Journal Citation Reports. And on this screen, I will type in the name of the journal that I want to look up. From here, I can see that the 2018 impact factor for this journal, Nature Immunology, is 23.53. Keep in mind that there is always a delay in the release of impact factors. I'm making this webinar in the spring of 2020, and as of right now, the 2018 impact factor is the most recent. Let's take a look at how the value is calculated, and you'll understand why this delay exists. Here you can see how the number was calculated. It is the total number of citations that 2016 and 2017 articles in this journal had in the year 2018 and then that number is divided by the total number of citable items published in the journal in 2016-2017. So 6,306 divided by 268 gives you 23.53. Now let's take a look at altmetrics. On this slide I have a definition from the website altmetric.com. From this definition, you can see a couple of things. One, altmetrics is not thought of as a substitute for traditional bibliometrics, but rather as a complement to using a bibliometric approach. Additionally, this definition lists many of the different data points that are considered when calculating an altmetric score. This includes things like social media, online reference management software like Mendeley, as well as research blogs. However, as with traditional citation-based bibliometrics, there are several pros and cons to using the newer altmetrics. A couple of the benefits are that altmetric scores develop faster because of the nature of the sources included. Once an article is published, it usually takes months if not years for citations to occur. So bibliometric scores can be slow to develop. But for altmetrics, data starts to compile a lot sooner. The biggest advantage of altmetrics, though, is the fact that it's possible to attain altmetric scores for articles and other forms of scholarly output which aren't covered by traditional bibliometrics. This is because altmetrics considers a wide variety of sources and inputs. Whereas, if an article is not indexed within a select number of commercial article databases, it can be very difficult to find accurate, trustworthy uh, information. The cons of altmetrics are that it's new, and so the value of an altmetric score is questionable in a lot of settings. People who evaluate the work of others are likely far more familiar with traditional citations-based bibliometrics, and so it's hard to say how much they would value an altmetric score, if at all. Related to that is the unclear value of some of the data measures within the altmetric score. How much value do we put into a tweet? Are mentions in scholarly blogs all equal? And so forth. 
Now let's take a look at some alt metrics examples. For this I'm going to look up the PlumX metrics which are mentioned in the Scopus database that we looked at before and I'm also going to look at the alt metrics badge which we can see in some of the articles contained in Himmelfarb's Health Sciences Research Commons. So here I am back at the Himmelfarb homepage. So again I'm going to go to Scopus And from here, I'm just going to do a search for the term diabetes. I just want to find a heavily cited article. So I do my search. And I want to find a heavily cited recent article. So I'm going to limit my results to just the last several years. And then for these recent articles, I'm going to sort them based on the most highly cited. So Here's one, Heart Disease and Stroke Statistics, the 2017 update, a report from the American Heart Association. So I'm going to click on that record. I'm going to give this a moment to load, and here you'll see this link to PlumX metrics. So if I click on this, I can get an idea of how they came to this score, the 258. So I see the citations, usage, etc. If I click on See Details, I can learn even more. So the first thing they show me are the traditional bibliometrics. So this article has been cited 3,437 times. However, if I scroll down, I can get a better idea of what values went into arriving at this PlumX metric score of 258.72. Uh, so we see citations, usage, so how many times uh, was this abstract viewed, captures, including things like online bibliographic management programs such as Mendeley, uh, mentions in blogs, news sources, Wikipedia, a number of tweets, and I can click on any of these numbers to learn more. So I'm going to go to blogs. And here I can see the blogs that uh, reference this particular article, so if I wanted to learn more about that. That was PlumX Metrics through Scopus. Now we're back at the Himmelfarb website and we're going to look at the HSRC or Health Sciences Research Commons. This is an institutional repository that's run by the Himmelfarb Health Sciences Library. Once here, I'm going to look for a particular article. I'll cut and paste the title in here. And this is the one I'm looking for, The Global Syndemic of Obesity, Undernutrition, and Climate Change. So I'm going to click on the, uh, that article. And here you can see the Altmetrics badge, which is sometimes referred to as the Altmetrics donut, this colorful donut with the number 2982 in the middle. So that is the Altmetric score for that particular article. I can also get PlumX metrics, but here I'm interested particularly in the Altmetrics badge. And if I click here, I can see more details about how that number came about. So what I see here are mentions uh, in news outlets, blogs, policy sources, tweets, etc. Citation information from products like Mendeley and so forth are also represented. So if I click on any of these, I can get more information. So for instance, the mention of blogs. I can see which 19 blogs this article was cited in. So the Altmetrics badge is another way of getting an Altmetric score for an article. One of the ways to get it is in articles that have been indexed or deposited in the Health Sciences Research Commons. Part of the software of the institutional repository will automatically attach the Altmetrics badge where it's appropriate. During this session, we covered the following things. We talked about the importance of being able to quantify the impact of your scholarly output. We also looked at the two main ways of quantifying scholarly output. This is traditional citation-based bibliometrics, as well as the newer altmetrics. We also looked at examples of each of these, as well as the pros and cons of using them. This concludes our session for today. Thank you for taking the time to listen to Measuring Impact, Quantifying the Effects of Your Research, 
a part of the Get Yourself Publish Promote Your Research webinar series from the Himmelfarb Library at the George Washington University. If you enjoyed this webinar, please join us for the next installment in our series, ORCHIDS, Maintaining Your Online Identity, which will be released on Wednesday, April 22nd. Also, if you have time and are able to complete our exit survey, we'd appreciate your feedback. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions about the content covered, please feel free to contact me directly at this email address, tph at gwu.edu. On behalf of the Himmelfarb Library Scholarly Communication Team, thank you for listening.